Hello, everyone from ADB headquarters in Manila. I'm Bambang Susantano, ADB Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development. Thank you for joining today's Asian Impact Webinar. It is my honor to welcome Professor Edward Glazer as the 57 ADB Distinguished Speaker. Since 1982, the Distinguished Speaker Program has allowed ADB to tap the knowledge of world-renowned scholars and practitioners to better understand development issues. Professor Ator Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glim Professor of Economics at Harvard University, where he has taught since 1992 after receiving his PhD from the University of Chicago. He is a global expert on urban issues and believer in cities. He has not only contributed seminal papers on virtually every major aspect of how cities function, but also shape how other scholars think about cities and their prosperity. His works combine the use of econometrics and statistical analysis with the assessment of historical records in defining how today's cities emerge and thrive or not. Of Professor Glaser, many publications, perhaps many of you have read his best-selling book, Triumph of the City. And in this book, he described why cities are one of humankind's greatest inventions, how they can bring prosperity, enhance sustainability, and transforming our lives for the better. One of the running themes in his major works is that industrial diversity and the human capital available to cities contribute strongly to their growth. The findings from his research have strong relevance for ADB's operations and offer concrete lessons. Let me just touch on just two. First, he highlights the importance of high quality cost benefit analysis of planned infrastructure investment. There is no doubt that modern infrastructure is essential for development, but some investment yield greater and more equitably distributed benefits than others. For example, transport infrastructure investment, when accompanied with flexible land use regulations, typically yield higher benefits. Second, Professor Glaser highlights the importance of thinking carefully about user incentive associated with infrastructure provisions. For example, modern sanitation networks may be underutilized by low-income households, as they may have weak incentives to use the infrastructure. A well-designed information program about the full benefits of using modern sanitation combined with some subsidy can be the answer. Conversely, in the case of roads, building new roads or widening existing ones may not reduce congestions for long if there is a rapid growth in vehicle ownership. To tackle congestion effectively, demand management mechanisms such as electronic road pricing and higher taxes imposed on car purchases may need to accompany new and better roads. This was done, for example, in Singapore. Experts project that by 2050, there will be some 3 billion people or almost three quarters, two thirds of the entire populations living in developing Asia town and cities. That is up from about 50% in 2018. Given this continued trend of urbanization, our challenge now is how to make our cities more livable. This challenge has become even greater with the arrival of the pandemic, which has hit urban areas hardest. The distinguished speaker session is therefore a timely opportunity to discuss cities and urban transformations. We will hear from the Professor Glazer his insights on the policy priorities that should guide Asia and its cities, including what the pandemic tells us about better planning and management of cities and urban infrastructure. So without further ado, let me now give the time to Professor Glazer. Professor, the screen is yours now. Thank you so much. Thank you for including me in this in this wonderful program. I'm I'm honored and delighted to be with you. I, I just wish I was with you in, in Manila, uh, which is certainly a, an exciting uh, uh, city and a um, a place where I've had a, both great conversations at the ADB and have enjoyed this this sense of urban life in that city. Um, so, if I was giving this talk uh, before the pandemic in 2019. I would perhaps start with a couple of slides like these, which are meant to highlight the enduring importance of urban areas in our world. This, these two figures 
come from data from the European Union, but I could show you very similar figures for the United States. Um, the blue line shows the relationship of GDP per capita and urban density. Each one of these dots represents uh, about 100 of Europe's nuts three regions, uh, going from the least dense to the most dense areas. And as you can see, the densest tenth of Europe's regions, the most urban of those regions, have incomes, have GDP per capita that are roughly double those in the least dense parts of Europe. There are many interpretations for the well-known link between urban density and productivity that it is in fact even stronger in Asia than it is in Europe. Of course, one reason is that places that are naturally more productive both attract people and end up with higher incomes. Uh, another possibility is that cities just have innately more able people. But I think the overwhelming consensus of the research community is that this is at least partially a treatment effect of density. That in fact, being enmeshed in a maelstrom of human economic activity actually does make us more productive. This is what we call agglomeration economies. And a typical estimate for the United States would be that as density doubles, per capita productivity goes up by about 6%. The impact of density is if anything larger in areas and with people that are more skilled. There's a complementarity between human capital and area density, partially because cities are about learning, cities are about cooperation, and we have more to teach each other when we are more skilled. It's also true that partially skills are about talents like the ability to speak or to write well, which are themselves communication skills which become more valuable in cities. The red line shows the relationship between population growth and initial density level. As you can see, the places that started with the least space, with the most crowding, also added the most people. So whereas Americans at the start of the 19th century were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, we are clustering in, not spreading out. Now, cities are not just about productivity, they are also about pleasure. Um, this shows the gulf between urban and rural happiness in different countries across the world. And so when each of these dots are positive, meaning they're above zero, it means the people who live in cities say that they are happier than the people who live in farms. When the dots are negative, people who live in rural areas are happier than people who live in urban areas. Uh, and as you can see in the rich countries over there on the right, there's really not much difference. You know, in some rich countries like uh, Italy and New Zealand, people who live in low density areas are happier and other rich countries like Sweden uh, and Uruguay, uh, you know, the United Kingdom, sorry, uh, people who live in urban areas are happier. But if you go to the poorest countries in the world, and I have only five here that are very poor, Rwanda, Mali, India, Ghana, Moldova, uh, in these places, there is a huge urban rural happiness gap and it favors uh, cities. Right? That in fact, it's not just that India's cities are more productive, it's that they're happier. There are two exceptions to that. Uh, Iraq, remember this data is somewhat old, it's from 2007. So this was a period in which Iraq cities were actually being bombed. Uh, and Thailand, I blame that on Bangkok's traffic jams, which are certainly among the worst in, in the world. Um, and so the point here is not that in fact, life in an Indian slum isn't somewhat hellish, it, it is but you can't compare it with your life in a developed uh, world city. You have to compare it with life in rural India and there's no future in rural poverty. Cities provide the only pathways from poverty to prosperity that I know, which is why it's so important that uh, entities like uh, the ADB do their work to try to make the cities of the world more livable, more humane, more productive and greater, greater places of opportunity. And uh, we have had over the past uh, 40 years, the rise of cities as, as places of consumption as well as places of production, places where cities, people go to have fun. Uh, this is an image of Nanjing Road uh, in Shanghai, which is of course one of the most well-functioning uh, urban spaces. And I like this image both because it reminds us that cities are places of play, uh, but also because it reminds us that good urban design is actually an important part of making cities enjoyable, which then makes them productive by attracting high human capital people. And one of the things I think that's particularly striking in Shanghai is the comparison between Nanjing Road, which is space that's built on a human scale that people use and love with the buildings, particularly in the, in the initial days, uh, built uh, in the Pudong district right across the river, uh, 
which were built to architecturally impress you. They were built to be spectacular monuments uh, to their owners rather than places of, of human connection. And you know, that's sort of an important part of city building is to remember that cities are not structures, right? Cities are humanity. The structures serve to, to make humans more functional, more enjoyable, happier. And so they really need to be designed around human needs. Of course, the downside of consumer cities is that the rise of, of cities as places of enjoyment as well as places of work mean that prices have gone up, particularly in places that don't build a lot. And that will be a running message of my uh, lecture today that cities really need to allow the growth and allow the new production of housing and new office space that is needed for transformation. I will say that I believe the cities of East Asia have been the best in the world on this. Whereas London, England has been one of the worst among this, Paris as well, uh, San Francisco, New York are all problematic in the sense that they bind their builders in straight jackets of local zoning rules, which make the city's future a hostage to the city's past. And you can see over here on the right, the very high prices in and around the London area. Now, all of this triumphant version of cities uh, is very pre-2020, very pre-COVID. Um, the past year has reminded us that there are also demons that come with density. There are many of these downsides of crowding. Uh, traffic jams are one, high housing costs are another. Crime can be a third, although that's far less of a problem in East Asia than it is, for example, in Latin America or the US. But the most terrible of the demons of density is contagious disease, is plague. The first well-documented example of an urban plague that I know of is the plague of Athens, which occurred in 430 BCE. This image is often used to bring back thoughts of that plague, of that first great urban plague. Um, although it's actually an image of a biblical plague by the French Baroque artist, Nicolas Poussin. Uh, the, the plague of Athens in some sense is so terrible because Athens burned so brightly as an urban star in the fifth century. In some sense, you know, the greatest thing that cities do is that they enable these chains of collaborative creativity that have powered humanity's greatest hits. And so it was in Athens during its golden age when a city that gave us philosophy, that gave us drama, that gave us democracy, that gave us much uh, of you know, Western mathematics, uh, that gave us uh, sculpture, that gave us architecture, right? It's a city in which genius flourished because it was connected to other forms of genius. It did all that we could possibly hope that a city can do to, to power humanity move forward. Yet it was also a city that was enormously vulnerable to plague for the same reason that cities are vulnerable to plague today, which is they are the nodes on the global transport and travel network. So they are the ports of entry for new disease and because their density allows disease to spread more quickly once it gets in. The backstory behind the Athenian plague was a battle, a war between Athens and Sparta. Athens was rising, Sparta had been the dominant military power. Uh, Sparta demanded that Athens let go of some of its allies, Athens refused and so a war was on. The strategy of the Athenian leader, Pericles, was to summon the Athenians within the walls of the great city uh, so they would be protected from Sparta's superior army and instead send out the Athenian fleet to harass the coast of the Peloponnesian Peninsula where Sparta was. The strategy was sound militarily. The Spartans couldn't break through Athens' walls, but a plague could. It entered through the port of Piraeus and then it spread like wildfire in the city. A quarter of the city's citizens died in the first wave of the plague and in a sense, it never fully recovered. Social chaos reigned, at least according to Thucydides, one of the fathers of history who emerged in Athens in that century, who witnessed the plague. Social chaos reigned because people thought there was no tomorrow and they, they behaved accordingly. And so in some sense, the glory of the city was dimmed forever. Uh, it was soldier on for another 25 years in its battle against Sparta, but uh, it was never the same. An even more terrible plague came to Europe in 541 CE, in 541 AD. Um, the backstory for that was that the city of Rome had fallen, the Roman Empire had collapsed, but the Eastern Roman Empire lived on in the city of Constantinople. And after the first wave of the foreign conquerors had lost their momentum and had devolved into internecine squabbling, um, the, Eastern Open Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire was poised to recapture the continent. It was poised to reimpose the Pax Romana 
on the Mediterranean world. And so the emperor Justinian sent out his warlord, Belisarius, to impose peace. He was conquering well. It looked like, in fact, you know, this dark period might end and Rome might be reestablished, you know, as, you know, China, the Chinese empire did, which maintained stability during this time period, it looked like Rome might survive. And yet just at the moment in which it looked as if Rome would succeed, the Black Death struck. 541, the first chronicled appearance of Yersinia pestis on European shores. And then for two centuries, the Black Death kept coming and coming completely derailing Justinian's effort, launching Europe into eight centuries of darkness, right? This is what plague does at its most terrible. And it depends, the impact of plague, the impact of pandemic depends upon the existing social strength. Justinian's world was so vulnerable because its future already teetered on the edge of a knife and it was ready to fall off when the plague hit. Now for most of the past seven centuries, our world has been relatively resilient to plague. In the 19th century, early globalization struck the cities of the world time and time again, and yet they continued to grow. That was both a sign of the urban social strength during that, that time period and the willingness of poor people to urbanize despite the risk of pandemic. And I think when we think about our future, urbanization will continue in the poor world whether or not we managed to fix this pandemic and make sure that it doesn't happen again. And um, uh, of course, it still matters that we fix the pandemic because if urbanization proceeds, it will be very deadly if we don't. But for the poor, you know, urbanization can be a matter of life itself if cities are the only pathway to avoid starvation. So they came despite yellow fever, which is a mosquito borne illness that emerges out of Africa, gets carried to the Caribbean and then comes up to the cities of the, of the Eastern seaboard in the early 19th century. Um, and then, of course, cholera, which emerges in the Ganges Delta in 1817, probably a, a mutation on an earlier disease that had been endemic in the area probably for three centuries or more before then. It marches along with the British Empire, which, of course, was an unbridled health disaster for India for 100 years from the time of cholera in 1817 to the time of the influenza pandemic 100 years later. Uh, and then it travels over land through Russia, over sea to the U United Kingdom and to Paris, and then across the, across the Atlantic Ocean to the United States. Cholera is a waterborne disease and it struck time and time again. Its death rates were much higher than the death rate from COVID-19. Um, and cities responded by building enormously expensive forms of infrastructure. Right? If there was an ADB in the 19th century, it would have been focused primarily on aqueducts and sewers, which were the weapons of choice against these pandemics. Now, they were actually used to fight pandemics because of medical confusion. There were two schools of thought about disease during the 19th century. One school emphasized contagion, the spread of illness from person to person. The other emphasized what was called miasma, the emergence of unclean air from foul soil. Right. It sounds crazy today, miasma, but in fact, it was the miasma theorists who said, you need to clean the swamp. You need to impose aqueducts. You need to build sewers, right? Whereas the contagion theorists just said, you have to have quarantines and they never were able to get the quarantines to work. So it turned out that the miasma theorists, although they weren't exactly right on the medicine, got the public health right. And so there was enormous amount of, of spending. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water and sewers in 1900, as our federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. And so as you can see, the death rates became, began to come down. Um, it was not just about infrastructure. You can see here that the Croton Aqueduct was built in 1842, and yet people continue to die of cholera for another 25 years. My great, great, great grandfather died in this cholera epidemic in 1849. Um, you also need incentives as well as infrastructure. And of course, the infrastructure itself needs functional institutions. And I will return to that later. The in reason why poor people continue to die of cholera for 25 years is the last mile problem. The same problem we have with building water mains in Sub-Saharan Africa today where I work on water. Um, because you would build aqueducts and you would say, oh, but you have to pay for the connection. And poor people said, well, we can't afford the connection. Right? So you perhaps would provide some free uh, hydrants, which is what they did in New York, but carrying water is heavy. And so they continue to rely on their boreholes and their uh, pit latrines, and they continue to die of cholera. And it's not until you have the Board of Health, 
which starts imposing rules on tenement owners and fines for not connecting that New York starts to get healthier. And so it reminds us that we need rules about infrastructure in order to make that infrastructure get used properly. I think the same lesson applies to Sub-Saharan Africa today. Now, for the past century, since the influenza pandemic 100 years ago, cities have seemed remarkably healthy. In 1900, a boy born in New York City could expect to live six years less than a boy born in rural America. For most of the past 15 years, New York has had a two to three year life expectancy advantage over the rest of the city. And then all of a sudden, plague reappeared. These were the death rates as of April from uh, COVID-19 in the United States. And as you can see, it was a highly urban pandemic in the early days, very concentrated in the New York and Boston areas. And then New Orleans, Atlanta, a few other urban areas, Detroit, right, were in the early days. And that's again, because the plagues come first to those urban areas that are the nodes on our transport and travel networks, right, those tourists coming into the US from Italy, where they had caught the disease and then spreading it like wildfire, the Biogen conference in Boston that may have led to the infection of half a million people. And of course, in dense urban confines, uh, the disease spreads more quickly, at least initially. This shows the relationship between population density and COVID-19 prevalence as of May in the US. But by November, the disease had spread almost everywhere. And of course, the difference between cholera which really is not gonna to spread to farms that have their own water sources that are unconnected to other human beings. And an airborne pandemic like influenza, COVID-19, is these airborne pandemics do not leave rural areas unscathed. And of course, we're seeing that in India itself right now. Um, but in Brazil, in India, the first wave was very urban. This shows the relationship between the share of the population living in a favela in Brazil in June and COVID cases. And as you can see, a strong positive relationship. And this is the relationship between the share of the population living in the slums and uh, COVID-19 infections as of, um, as of, of uh, June as well. Now, one of the things that's very striking about India is because of the incredible work of Anup Malani, who did serological work, blood work in slums, we know that in fact, by July, 50% of many Mumbai slums uh, residents already had been exposed to COVID-19. Um, and their death rates during that time period were fairly low, partially because slum dwellers in India tend to be thin and partially because they tend to be young. And so the more terrible Indian COVID experience that we've seen more lately has to do, of course, with the spread of COVID to areas that are outside the slums that have been relatively protected. Now, density itself, sort of density that many East Asian cities embrace in terms of height, is not necessarily uh, unhealthy. Um, and this shows COVID cases in New York City around May. And I don't know how many of you know the geography of New York, but most of you have probably spent most of your time in this area which is downtown Manhattan. Uh, the United Nations will be about here, uh, Wall Street about here. Uh, this is the Midtown area, Grand Central Station. This is the area in New York with its highest towers, okay? And it had the lowest cases of COVID-19, okay? This is Brooklyn Heights. Again, one of the denser parts of Brooklyn, low cases. Whereas these areas, the South Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, which are lower density areas, they had the highest rates of COVID cases. Why is that? Well, there's nothing particularly unhealthy about being in a skyscraper. There's nothing particularly wrong with that. Um, and the people in these denser areas change their behavior most. And luckily, due to cell phone data that's been made available by SafeGraph, we can measure how mobility changed after the crisis. And so this shows the reduction in the number of trips by zip code. And as you can see, the people that lived in those skyscrapers were the ones who reduced their trips most. Okay, that's primarily because they were wealthy and they were in industries that enabled them to Zoom to work. Whereas these people in the outer boroughs were in vital industries, they were not wealthy, uh, they were not in industries that enabled them to Zoom, and so they were more likely to get the disease. And that reminds us of how very unequal the impact of COVID-19 has been. This shows the cell phone uh, mobility, this is from work from Couture, Dingle, Green, Hanbury, and Williams, uh, uh, Cell phone mobility for the most educated 10th uh, in Pennsylvania, the least educated 10th. Before COVID, more educated people moved much more. After COVID, more educated people moved much less. Okay, um, That's because the technology was more helpful for the more educated people. The other thing that's important here is that these things were not binding 
uh, rules. This was the binding rule. And so it was often depicted that, you know, governments face this clear trade off between health and wealth, that if you only kept the businesses open, that at least you would have uh, wealth. But that just wasn't true in the, in the West. If you didn't shut the businesses down, people still stopped going to them. Fear, not regulation, shut down the economy. Uh, a nice piece of evidence on this is a, is a paper that was done comparing Denmark and Sweden. Denmark had, had very tough lockdown rules. Sweden had none. And yet during the height of the pandemic, uh, Sweden's GDP was down by 25%. Uh, Denmark's economic activity was down by 29%. And so both countries had huge declines in economic activity, regardless of the fact that Sweden had few regulations to bind it. Fear, not regulation, was the power. And this just shows the relationship between COVID cases in New York and mobility. Our estimates are that a 10% reduction in the number of trips was associated with a 20% reduction in the number of cases. And this shows the relationship between the number of trips and the share of workers in essential industries, a strong positive correlation. This shows the relationship between uh, the number of trips and the share of people in industries that enabled teleworking. Um, so teleworking was the, was the secret sauce for keeping you healthy. Now, one of the reasons why I think I'm afraid of the, of the impact of this disease is that our cities in some sense felt much weaker in 2020 than they did in 2001. In 2001, when the terrorists attacked uh, the World Trade Center, uh, our cities felt very strong. They'd been on a 20 year renaissance in the West. Um, and so they struck something that felt strong. For the past 10 years, city, our, the cities of the West have felt increasingly problematic. Um, I'll just give you three examples of this. The first of which is they're bringing productivity, but not opportunity. These are the failures of America's education system. Secondly, successful cities are becoming permanently unaffordable. This is work with Joe Jerko and others. Uh, and third, uh, our, because our cities aren't growing enough, because our cities aren't welcoming in space, we have an increasingly jobless heartland. And we have, in some sense, the closing of the urban frontier, the closing of the urban escape valve. All of these things come from an America that increasingly privileges insiders over outsiders, that makes it difficult for people who aren't already entrenched to get theirs. This shows the relationship between density and per capita productivity. In the US, a strong positive relationship. This uses data on mobility that my colleagues Raj Chetty, Nathan Hendren, um, and John Friedman have put together. This shows where this looks at people who are born around 1980, controls for parental income, and asks where in the income distribution do they end up 35 years later? And so this shows that people who live in low density areas and people who grew up in low density areas end up being richer than people who grow up in high density areas, okay? Um, at least for the cohort born in 1980. Um, this is probably the result of America's urban schools, which have so often failed their youth. This shows the relationship between construction and prices along the y-axis, along the vertical axis, is the gulf between the price of housing and the cost of building housing. Uh, along the x-axis, along the horizontal axis, is the amount of new construction relative to the initial stock of housing. And as you can see, the places that build a lot aren't expensive, and the places that are expensive aren't, don't build a lot. There's no repealing the laws of supply and demand. If you want a city where demand is high to be affordable, you must allow enough building. And yet we have far too many rules that restrict construction, that turn cities into boutique towns that are affordable only to the wealthy, like San Francisco. And this just shows America's jobless heartland. You know, before COVID-19, I was convinced the rise of prime age male joblessness was America's largest social problem. When I was born in 1967, 5% of prime age men uh, were jobless. For most of the past decade, more than 15% of America's prime age men have been jobless. And that is not geographically neutral. There is a swath of despair starting down in Alabama and Mississippi, running up through the Appalachian Mountains in Kentucky and West Virginia and ending up in the cities of the Rust Belt, where in some of these areas, more than one in four prime age males are jobless. And joblessness is a much worse curse than being a member of the working poor. Um, one of the ways that we could fix this problem is by having these people come to cities. Because indeed, uh, there is no future in manufacturing uh, for employment. America will continue to manufacture things, but we will, like the great urban economies of Asia, manufacture using machines rather than low-skilled labor. Um, the future for low-skilled men is in, like for the future for low-skilled women, is in the urban service sector. Uh, and yet, that service sector doesn't exist in the Eastern heartland. They need to come to cities. 
But that transformation, the rise of the urban service sector, is what made our economies so vulnerable to COVID-19. The broad arc of history has seen a move from farm right, to factory to urban service job. And that, that move, those moves have made us increasingly vulnerable to the plague. Subsistence farming is not at all vulnerable right, to plague, at least in its economic function. So think about the Black Death when it struck Europe in 1350, the second time. It killed off one third of all Europeans, an absolutely terrible event in world history. Um, but the economy it left behind was richer because the wealth in a subsistence agriculture economy comes from the ratio of land to people. And if you have more land per capita, you end up having workers who are better paid. And that's exactly what happened. The manufacturing economy that followed um, ended up being much more resilient as well. Because while the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, which is uh, very well documented by Francois van der Velde of the Chicago Fed, why, while it temporarily shut down factories and mines, it, it didn't permanently shut them down because people don't stop buying washing machines because there's a pandemic. They still need cars. They still need manufactured goods. The pandemic doesn't fundamentally distort the business model. Over the past hundred years, those factories have become mechanized in the US, they've become outsourced. And so workers have moved to urban service economies where the ability to serve a cappuccino with a smile has been an employment safe haven for many less skilled workers. And yet those jobs can vanish in a heartbeat when that smile turns into a source of peril rather than a source of pleasure. This just shows the evolution of work um, over the past 20 years. The light blue line that starts at the top and ends at the bottom is manufacturing, right? Uh, far fewer manufacturing jobs. These two lines in the middle are the urban service sectors, leisure, hospitality, retail, trade. Together, they are 32 million American workers, one fifth of the American employed labor force before the COVID pandemic. These are the industries that are maximally vulnerable either to getting the disease if they continue to work or of losing their jobs. The top two lines are somewhat safer. The green line is education and health services. These are typically backstopped by the government. And so while they were vulnerable to getting the disease, they were less vulnerable to losing their jobs. And this orange line is the uh, professional and business services. Those are the well-educated sectors that keep their jobs. Uh, you can see here, this came from a very early survey that we did in April about America's slow bu small business closures, 45% of the small businesses in our sample were closed as of April, but there was huge heterogeneity between the professional business services like banking and finance, only 19% of them were closed, to industries like personal services, that's like being a, a personal trainer uh, or arts and entertainment, 70% or 86% of them were closed. Amazingly, they still expected to be closed in December, um, and we thought this was going to be Armageddon for small businesses. It turned out to be less so in part because the US government has spent more than a trillion dollars on the Paycheck Protection Program trying to bail them out. Now, looking forward, infrastructure seems to be the recipe, one of the recipes that at least the Biden administration thinks that we will be using uh, to um, fight this. Now, the ADB is a major player in infrastructure. And I, I, I'm gonna make the case here for doing more study on understanding how procurement of infrastructure is done. Because uh, procurement is an understudied topic in economics, despite the absolutely beautiful and great work of uh, uh, Lafont and Tirol. Um, we have not done enough study of procurement, particularly in areas where corruption is a real problem. Um, and procurement is, you know, one fourth of global GDP in some areas uh, and 15 percent overall and uh, an unbelievably important topic. So we tend to focus on simple issues about uh, you know, when we think about the sort of philosophy of government and economies, we tend to focus on public ownership versus private ownership as a massive divide. But public ownership is often associated with private provision because the public goods are, are often built by a private company. Very rarely is public infrastructure 100% public, right? The construction phase typically requires a highly specialized labor force and that makes outsourcing appealing. Yet private builders often seem to build better and cheaper roads when the client is a private company and I'll show you evidence on that for one second, then when the evidence is, a, is, a, is when the client is a public company. Uh, across the world, public procurement may be the most important source of government corruption, rivaling regulatory relief and the underpricing of public services. And within the US, the rules regarding public procurement add or subtract billions and create higher or lower quality infrastructure. 
Um, this just shows Ram Singh's fascinating work. Here he's comparing public-private partnerships. This is road roughness. Um, very smooth in the ones which are public-private, very rough in the ones that are purely public. Ram believes this, the difference is because when the private companies do their own procurement, they actually make sure that the quality is high. When the public sector does it, it ends up being low quality. Now, we often think about regulation as the regulation of the private sector, where there's usually a trade-off between the negative externalities, right? You want to regulate things where there are negative externalities, but you want to free individuals to be, make their own choices. So we're trading off reducing negative externalities with reducing individual autonomy. These are actually not the trade-offs in the regulation of government. The trade-off is between limiting socially harmful but privately advantageous actions by the government entity, i.e. corruption, and allowing the leeway for more subtle strategies that benefit society, i.e. choosing a better uh, high, high cost builder, even if the costs are slightly higher. They're more like the rules within companies or universities. And the optimal regulation of government will depend about how aligned the public actors' interests are with society as a whole. Together with the World Bank, we put together a procurement survey, the questionnaire completed by more than 1,200 professionals across 187 countries involved in procurement activity, including lawyers, construction and engineering firms, and procuring entities. In each country, we only consulted with professionals who've been involved in procurement of work contracts with the relevant procuring entity over the pre previous 12 months. Lawyers answered law questions, engineers answered engineering questions, et cetera. We did two rounds in 2018 and 2019. The, the survey was structured like other doing business surveys around a hypothetical case, building a road. And these are the types of questions we asked. We asked sort of by law, do procurement plans need to be made publicly available by the procuring entity? And then we asked in practice, are procurement plans made available by the procuring entity and so forth? We can divide things up into quality of product, which includes things like the overall quality of the road, how often are, the are there overruns in terms of the budget? How often does it take too long? And then there is the, the integrity of the process, which includes questions about favoritism, bribes, collusion, and whether or not there's any competition. Um, we find in general that the laws, the regulating procuring entities are stricter in poor countries. And this shows that relationship. It's they're higher typically in poor places. Practices, of course, are much better in rich countries. Okay. And there's a puzzle that lies at the heart of this, which is stronger laws do predict better practices. Better practices predict better integrity of process, less favoritism, less corruption, and so forth. Integrity of process creates quality of product, and that's good, right? Uh, it, but laws do not improve the quality of product, okay? So laws predict practices, practices predict process, process predict outcomes, but laws are not associated with the quality of output. And if you want to ans answer me to explain the answer to that, I will do so, but only in the q and I wanna end with uh, a last, said just asking the question that I think is foremost on many urbanists mind, which is, will the boost in remote working become permanent? This just shows the cell phone mobility data for five countries, uh, both rich and poor, and the decline in the number of people going to work during the onset of the COVID pandemic. This is not the first time that we've asked whether or not new technologies will make face-to-face -face contact in the cities that enable that contact obsolete. 40 years ago, the, the urbanist, not the, ur the, the futurist Alvin Toffler wrote a book called The Third Wave, in which he predicted that information technology would make offices obsolete, would turn people back into home workers, and would cause an Armageddon for cities throughout the world. He was wrong. But he was writing during a period in which it looked like the age of the city had gone. In some sense, you want to think about the broad sweep of history as either having centripetal or centripetal or centrifugal periods. Centripetal periods are periods in which technologies bring people closer together in cities. Many of the technologies in the 19th century were centripetal. Steam engines, railroads, skyscrapers, elevators, streetcars, all of these were technologies that enabled and encouraged people to come to cities. Many 20th century technologies were centrifugal. They pushed people away from cities. Cars above all, which enabled mobility in low density areas, but also radios and televisions that enabled people to enjoy pleasures that had previously been exclusively urban in low density settings. Toffler was writing in the 1970s in the aftermath of you know, an urban implosion in the West. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not car production in Detroit. It was garment production in New York City. And this cluster was hammered by globalization and new technologies. And so it was natural for him to ask, would these technologies also 
right? With the new technologies, information technologies, kill off, right? Urban information industries, kill off printing and publishing, print, kill off uh, the, the urban uh, company headquarters. But it, for 40 years, it didn't happen. And these are two images that I've often used, one of which this is the Wallace office at Michael Bloomberg's City Hall, which was based on the Wallace office at uh, Bloomberg's company, which is based on the Wallace office at uh, Solomon Brothers, where Bloomberg worked before starting his own company. Um, and in some sense, this Wallace office or the Tr Solomon Brothers trading floor reminds us of the incredible value of face-to-face -face contact in high information industries. You know. JP Morgan Chase was one of the first companies to demand that its traders come back on the trading floor this year, last year now in, in September, um, because there is no industry in which being a little bit smarter can make you vastly richer than in finance, right? And that's why finance has been such a mainstay of urban areas for the last 40 years, is that they have been willing to pay the cost of urban areas because it is just so important to be next to everyone, because knowledge is more important than space. And what globalization and new, and new technologies have done is they've radically increased the returns to being smart. And we are a social species that gets smart by being around other smart people. If Toffler was right, you would think that companies like Google, right, would, which have the access to the most sophisticated forms of electronic interaction, wouldn't, would have sent everyone home, would have told everyone to telecommute before 2020, 2020. But they didn't. They bought the Googleplex. They bought a million and a half square feet in downtown Manhattan because in a more complex world, it is easier for ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who has ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through to your audience. And we have accumulated these cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. That's why face-to-face -face contact is so valuable. It's also more fun. Now, what do we know about the current uh, Zoom environment? Will this somehow or other push us over a precipice? We do know that there are many jobs that can be done productively long distance. So we have evidence from a beautiful paper that Nick Bloom wrote about seven years ago, uh, looking at call center workers in China who are randomly allocated to work from home and to work uh, live. He found those call center workers were more productive at home. This is similar work done by my, my students, Natalia Emanuel and Emma Har Harrington, who show that when you send the workers home, uh, post-COVID or in a pre-COVID experiment, uh, the call center work has become more productive. Now, call center work is very particular work. It's, it's relatively simple. It's easy to monitor. And so it's not surprising that this worked pretty well. But even here, we see this problem that, in fact, um, when you look at promotions, and this is the promote, the top one is promote to mid-level, the bottom ones are promotion to, to top level, huge difference. The on-site workers get promoted much more. And this highlights the role of face-to-face -face contact in enabling learning. What does an upper level promotion mean for a call center worker? It means you have the skills to handle the difficult calls. How would you get those skills? Well, you'd have to listen to people. How would your boss know that you were good at doing those things? She would have to listen to you. And so face-to-face -face contact is what's a crucial element in the learning process that is part of productivity in the 21st century. You see a similar fact in new hires. So while Microsoft has told us that its programmers are just as productive at, at home, the overall number of new job postings for programmers across the universe of burning glass postings was down by 40% between February and September of last year. This shows this in a more comprehensive way. This is from the work of Morales Aria and Dabouin, right? These are jobs that are live, that can't be done remotely. Um, employment dropped a lot. And so did postings, but they both came back more or less by the summer. These are remote jobs, okay? Remote jobs in, in employment stayed steady because they could still do the work at away. The postings dropped and stayed dropped. People weren't willing to hire new workers. They needed them live to enable them to teach them, to bring them to be part of the culture. And if we're going towards a world of remote work, work we're going to a world that is unbelievably unequal, right? So while many of us, we're having a perfectly good time doing remote work in last year, right? Uh, for less educated people, this was a complete catastrophe, both in the US and in the developing world, right? So this just shows among people who were teleworking during the pandemic, 70% of people with advanced degrees were teleworking in May, only 5% of people with who are high school dropouts were, were uh, teleworking, only 15% of people who were high school graduates, but no college were teleworking. So a hugely unequal world if this occurs. This just shows projections. We asked people in uh, May and April what share of people they thought were coming back. Uh, and we found that about 40% or more of firms in these two samples said that 40% or more of the workers who switched to remote will stay remote. We'll see if that persists. Now, 
as I gaze into my crystal ball, I think everything depends upon the length of the problem. If the shock um, is over relatively quickly, if the vaccines basically work, um, then it's going to be a, a significant shock, but not catastrophic. If the shock doesn't end quickly, if the vaccines fail, if, pan if another pandemic reappears, then I think this is an absolutely central shock to the cities of the wealthy world. But even if it's over, right, we still are going to have massive dislocations in various ways. In rich cities, this will mean that prices will drop more than vacancies will rise. Commercial space may be more vulnerable than residential. And the reason that I say this is that young people are, and all of us really, are so eager to be back with other human beings again, even if we're not necessarily eager to go back to the same old job. Cities will therefore reallocate from the old to the young, and some significant work will move to homes or lower density locales. And this will be particularly troubling in those cities which had fit political challenges before COVID-19. So across the US, you have some cities like San Francisco or New York. You have plenty of room for real estate prices to drop by 20 or 30 percent, but those offices will still remain open. You will not have the major problem of vacancies. You may have some conversion of class C uh, real estate to residential. In the low cost parts of the world, you could easily see massive vacancies and they will spill over to related retail that, that's involved in selling things to people who usually come downtown. Our cities in the West are in a very progressive mood. Um, and this has the potential to be somewhat catastrophic because if cities now try to tax their rich and tax their businesses, those rich in businesses have never been more mobile than ever and they will leave. And so we run the risk of repeating the events of the 1970s in which cities tried to treat their wealthy residents as piggy banks and those wealthy people, those industries just left. And the city of New York, for example, stood on the edge of vacancy. But the persistent COVID-19, uh, persistent risk of COVID-19 uh, implies that all rich cities are at risk. We consequently need something really robust, a rich country NATO for health. Um, this means we need to take extraordinary steps to ensure that this doesn't happen again. We need to have preemptive research. We need to speed the vaccine pipeline. We need to have global coordination and something robust, NATO, not the UN. Perhaps we need a trade of aid related to sanitary infrastructure. And I believe the ADB can play a central role in this. That, that means sewers, that means uh, aqueducts, that means not relying on antibiotics to deal with waterborne diseases in the developing world, but actually making sure those diseases are eliminated so they don't breed antibiotic resistant superbugs. And perhaps the quid pro quo is that we have more enforcement of hygienic rules that enable separation from humans and from animals or forcing people to connect to the water lines. But my last comment, I will just end on this. And these are two images of Tokyo which of course has risen from the catastrophes of, of the 1940s to be one of the great capitals of, of the world. Cities are amazingly resilient. They've been through worse than COVID-19. They will be through worse again, and they will survive this. And they continue to provide the best hope for humanity. They, they continue to enable chains of collaborative creativity, and they continue to be places of promise. So thank you for all you do for helping to build the cities of Asia, which I believe can be an example to the whole world. Thank you for your time. Thank you for including me in this program. Thank you, Professor Glazer, for a very interesting and insightful talk. Um, I am Madhavi Pandit, and I will be moderating a brief panel discussion and the question answer session going forward. Uh, today, we have invited uh, Yasuyuki Sawada, ADB's chief economist, Teresa Ko. Director General of the East Asia Department, and James Leather, Chief of the Transport Sector Group, to provide their reflections on this interesting topic and what this research could mean for ADB support to its developing members. I would also like to mention to the audience that ahead of the Q&A session, you can include your questions in the Q&A box or hit like on questions that others have asked. Um, this is for Professor Glazer, and we will get to as many as possible during the allotted time. Okay, let me begin with our chief economist. Yasu, as an economist and the person spearheading ADB's research agenda, what are your thoughts on, on the insights of Professor Glazer's research? Over to you, Yasu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madhavi. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Glazer, for very, very insightful and uh, exciting uh, lecture today. I really learned a lot from the presentation. Uh, and also, I, I found that empirical patterns from the US uh, overlap somewhat with the emerging tendency in developing Asia. Uh, in any case, uh, I got the three take home messages based on lecture. And also, I'd like to ask one question, if, uh, if I may. So first uh, take home message I got is a positive side of cities and urbanization. Urbanization city have been the center of innovation 
generating a huge benefits for people and businesses. Uh, this is uh, certainly true for Asia. Uh, uh, September um, uh, 2019, around one and a half years ago, we released uh, Asian Development Outlook update, same chapter titled Fostering Growth and Inclusion in Asian Cities. So in this um, uh, same chapter, we did a number of uh, 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 empirical analysis, uh, for example, using uh, big data night light to track real uh, shape of uh, urbanization over uh, a few decades. And I've, uh, we found uh, developing Asia is really urbanizing rapidly. And also urbanization and its agglomeration economies have been a really central source of economic growth and job creation in Asia. And uh, in our, our report, again, uh, we took a stock of existing studies and our own data analysis showing uh, enabling workers and firms to interact closely. Uh, cities really generate um, uh, increase in productivity through uh, several channels. Um, uh, and also uh, in uh, Professor Grazer's presentation, I was interviewed very much uh, in underdeveloped a situation, rural to urban transformation or migration from rural to urban generate a lot of uh, uh, happiness and well-being, uh, which would be certainly uh, true for many developing Asia right now. Uh, and uh, this could be attributed to a better access to infrastructure and wide variety of different services available in cities of developing countries. So I learned a lot. So this is the first uh, uh, take home. Uh, message. Secondly, um, uh, challenges of urban, urbanization cities. That's um, a second very important message from the lecture. Uh, having seen the benefits of cities, urban clusters uh, involve a wide variety of costs, such as the risks, including uh, COVID-19 infections, and also massive negative externalities arising from disasters triggered by other natural hazards. Um, actually, I'm originally from uh, one of the largest urban clusters in Japan called the uh, Hanshin, Hanshin area, including a Kobe city. Um, uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, Kobe city is a beautiful uh, city, which has both a port, a beautiful port and mountains, uh, somewhat similar to San Francisco. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Kobe city was uh, hit by a big earthquake in 1995. And um, um, because um, uh, mega urban center hit by big earthquake, um, um, uh, this led to a massive human losses, more than uh, 5,000 people killed almost instantaneously. And uh, my, my late parents also lost their home uh, because of this uh, earthquake. So making uh, cities resilient is so imperative, uh, I think. And uh, also uh, another cost of city is affordability of housing and immobile, you know, lack of mobility and inaccessibility due to uh, uh, traffic jams and congestion, et cetera, et cetera. So from a general perspective, I think um, um, uh, second message I got is uh, by nature, cities involve a lot of market failures, including an incomplete market for these disaster risks and other negative externalities, uh, which needs a public intervention and regulation. So uh, right mechanism design of minimizing uh, both the market failure and the government failure uh, uh, seems to be really critical. And uh, infrastructure uh, funded through PPP, uh, touched by uh, Professor Grazer, seems to be the area where both market failures and government failures are well controlled potentially. So I think uh, this is a very important uh, message I got. And um, in our report, Agent Development Outlook Update 2019, we also highlighted this, um, uh, realizing uh, cities' promise requires a kind of a holistic agenda for cities. Uh, cities must ensure uh, efficient multimodal public transportation system, uh, proper land use plan and regulation that are aligned with the uh, infrastructure investment and affordable housing with access to basic infrastructure as well as uh, social services such as education, healthcare. And also simultaneously, especially in uh, uh, evolving uh, uh, size of uh, a big city in, in Asia, I think uh, different cities must work well together as a system of uh, internalize a large scale spill over the externality. Uh, good connectivity infrastructure between cities and hinterland, mechanisms for better coordination of spatial and economic planning at the various scales, um, uh, city level, city cluster, regional level or national level. I think this is uh, really uh, uh, imperative. And third uh, take home message um, uh, based on the um, uh, Professor Grazer's uh, lecture is uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 really facilitated digitalization of our daily life and change our uh, work modality uh, dramatically, uh, which may change urban uh, landscape permanently. Uh, even in sitting in Manila right now, um, uh, one of the most densely populated city in the world, 
before COVID-19, agglomeration economies and the uh, uh, central petal forces were seemingly so strong uh, in Manila. Uh, uh, but as one of the workers on the full uh, work from home arrangement, I feel I don't need to stay here, uh, nearby city center, and many of my colleagues are scattered around uh, the world. So now face-to-face -face meetings are not always necessary in our workplaces. We can purchase food and uh, other necessary items online almost everywhere, almost anytime. So I agree, um, uh, Professor Grazer, if uh, pandemic persists, uh, these will act as a permanent centrifugal forces of cities. Uh, I think uh, probably uh, something like a virtual cities may emerge in which people are sparsely located physically, but uh, virtually grouped together through the digital platform. So this may enhance a further productivity of cities with minimizing their drawbacks, such as uh, too much congestion and unaffordable housing prices. But at the same time, as uh, uh, Professor Grazer discussed, there will be no negligible heterogeneous impact on such century fugal forces on different uh, groups. So I think uh, this is a very, very um, important message and we need to wait and see what's gonna happen uh, in next uh, few years. Mm -hmm. So these are my take home message from the lecture. And um, uh, if I may, I'd like to um, uh, ask one uh, question uh, if time allows. Um, I'm a great fan of uh, your early work on social capital and trust. And um, um, market failures and government failures, uh, that's a rampant. And um, uh, at least we cannot, um, uh, we can do a second best uh, world. So uh, in the area where uh, market fails and government cannot uh, correct market failure hundred uh, percent, I think the social capital or community mechanisms within cities uh, in our settings may uh, play uh, uh, also at least partial role to amend the market failure and government failure. Uh, well designed the urban infrastructure can nurture uh, quality infrastructure, growing the people uh, together. And uh, now uh, COVID-19, we see um, uh, uh, things like a community food pantry, you know, mutual helping each other um, uh, for eating emerging. So I, I thought that there is some potential and also using uh, um, uh, SNS, um, uh, you know, social capital may play a very important role in the next generation uh, cities in amending again uh, market failure and uh, uh, government failure. So I'd like to um, know what is your response to uh, this kind of uh, mm -hmm. area. I stop here. I'd like to thank again uh, Professor Grazer for a wonderful and very insightful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your kind words. And, and of course, I agree with you on, on social capital. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer now or wait for the rest of the rest of the comments. Uh, uh, we could wait for all the comments, Professor Glazer. Uh, thank you, Yasu, for summarizing the key messages, including in the Asian context and reflected in ADB's own knowledge work, especially the Asian development outlook. Uh, we will look forward to Professor Glazer's responses to your idea of virtual cities as well as social capital and community mechanism. But let me move on to Teresa Ko. Director General of East Asia Department, who has many years of experience working in the urban sector. Teresa, we have heard a lot about cities being an engine of growth, and it is well known that ADB works extensively in this area. Can you throw some light on what is the approach of ADB when it comes to these issues that were raised in today's lecture? Over to you, Teresa. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, Professor Glazer, for a, a very insightful lecture. Um, when we started our urban operations in the early to mid 90s, we focused on uh, standalone water supply investments and, uh, and we were really focused on aff affordability and access uh, during that period of time. Uh, we then uh, moved to an integrated uh, model where we would combine water, wastewater, uh, sewerage, drainage, uh, solid waste management interventions uh, to make uh, cities more livable and, and to provide the basic uh, urban uh, provision uh, in, in a more, I would say, com comprehensive manner. And uh, we found that after a few years that sustainability uh, was only possible with the presence of strong institutions that uh, ensured uh, financial sustainability. And as the mega cities developed, we began to see the potential that cities could be in terms of being engines of growth. And in fact, when I was working in India, we saw the potential uh, given that the government of India had a make in India policy that promoted manufacturing as well as an Act East policy, looking to see how India can join the global production networks uh, that were very dynamic in Asia, uh, 
uh, in the mid-2015 uh, to, uh, mid, uh, uh, to 2016 period. And so we did uh, uh, create and uh, assisted the government of India in a very large program to actually provide um, infrastructure and not just urban infrastructure, we call it trunk infrastructure, where uh, we took uh, the stretch of uh, the East Coast Economic Corridor that was actually assigned to us. And what we did was uh, we provided an investment program where we would invest invest in uh, transport roads, um, in energy, and uh, in, uh, in urban provision of basic water, wastewater, solid waste management interventions for the purpose of making cities more competitive. And, and we combine that with policy-based loans so that we can actually uh, enable uh, the, uh, the, the cities or the nodes, the industrial nodes that we were involved in to actually uh, promote the ease of doing business and, uh, and, and to create institutional frameworks that promoted industrialization. And, and we found this uh, was, was a good model for us to be able uh, to, uh, to participate or to help countries participate in the global production networks, um, making cities uh, greater engines of growth. And um, uh, at the same time, uh, on, the, on the other side of the region, uh, where I'm now uh, involved, which is in, in China, we were seeing industrialization happening at a very fast pace. And so 40 years of industrialization actually brought uh, the problems uh, of, of uh, severe air pollution. And so in the greater Beijing Tian, Tianjin area, we actually provided loans, a policy-based loan, loan again as a start, uh, the policy-based loan, uh, uh, enabling the government uh, to enact laws uh, to, uh, to promote the switch to cleaner sources of fuel, uh, to ban uh, open, mass, uh, op open biomass burning, uh, to actually help transform some jobs, uh, reduce the use of coal-fired boilers, and all this for the purpose of actually uh, improving the quality of air. Um, and uh, and from from uh, from China, we also adopted uh, this program in Mongolia, where we actually were successful in uh, improving the air quality. And um, as we look now uh, in, into into the future, uh, we are looking at the concept of healthy and age friendly cities, uh, particularly in our China program, uh, because uh, because of the the fact that uh, one in almost one in five are aging uh, in in uh, in China, uh, it is projected by 2050 uh, that maybe uh, with the current uh, population growth projections that it could even be up to one, one to three. I mean, one in three would be aging. And so we have, uh, we have integrated a model from the WHO and UNESCO uh, and aligned it with the Healthy China 2030 plan uh, to actually uh, create a health impact assessment tool and a healthy and age-friendly cities action and management plan. And these tools that we are using uh, would be for the purpose of looking at health impacts on, on uh, children, the elderly, and, uh, and, and uh, people living in the city to determine how to plan cities better and how to prioritize investments that would result in healthy and, and, uh, and, and uh, urban designs that would promote greater livability, uh, greater mobility, um, and, uh, and would promote uh, physical and mental uh, well-being uh, improvements of those who are living in, in those areas. And uh, what, what struck me is that with the continued growth of cities and, and the fact that cities, despite COVID-19, will continue to attract um, uh, people for the purpose of jobs and good jobs and, uh, and better li living conditions and, of course, happiness. Um, my question is, um, how do you how do you foresee um, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, trend of using another way of looking at things, which is the healthy uh, sit, health health impact assessment? Uh, looking looking at the way in which uh, we would evaluate uh, prioritization of urban investments um, post COVID nineteen, I, I would be interested in finding out your views on this aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa, for walking us through ADB's evolution in developing cities and urban areas and on touching on so many topics, affordability, financial sustainability, institutions, governance and planning. Our last panelist here, uh, James Leather, heads ADB's transport sector group. 
Well, cheap and fast transport is vital for the functioning of cities. James, how do you think the issues raised today should affect the advice and support from ADB to our developing members? Over to you, James. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Professor. Fascinating talk. I just want to raise three issues. Um, first off, history. Um, great lessons at the beginning. I think we can all learn an awful lot from what has happened in the past. Um, and how we can apply those to what's happening currently and what may well happen in the future. But I think history also shows us that we need to change and we need to adapt to the different circumstances and no more so have we seen that than the last year and a half with the COVID pandemic. Um, but it also brings a point in terms of monitoring and managing the transport systems, uh, looking from a transport perspective, which brings me to the second point. And I think this was from my perspective, from a the advice we would give to our client governments was perhaps the most salient point was, was on the infrastructure and the procurement process. Fascinating flow in terms of the, the laws leading to better practices um, and better processes, but not necessarily the laws leading to better quality of infrastructure. Now, within ADB, we are pushing for quality infrastructure, but it shows, as, as Teresa was, was mentioning also, the need for those institutions and the procedures and the processes to be put in place. Um, as cities um, interact and how people move around those cities, it, it, we, we're looking beyond just the infrastructure, but also how the systems um, are operating and how they integrate with one another as well. So in terms of those processes and practices and the ability going back to the historical part in terms of managing the cities, I think again, the advice we're looking at is how we operate systems, how we provide that infrastructure, but how that infrastructure forms part of an integrated transportation system that allows people to move around. And this brings me to the final point, which is picking up on, on the COVID, but putting a little spin on it from within the Asian context and the Asian transport, urban transport. Um, you showed some fascinating uh, information on the impacts of different types of work. One large difference in um, many of the urban transport systems around Asia is the very high employment levels, particularly in the informal transport or the paratransit. When a lot of the transport systems were shut down, and in many cities they still are shut down, 20-30% of the population or households were receiving their income from that informal transport, be they tuk-tuks, jeepneys, or rickshaws, whatever it may be, across the different modes of transport. Very similar, you can't take that home and you can't do distance learning, uh, sorry, just um, remote working if your job is actually moving those people around. So I think the impact on transport and the impact on employment, will we see those come back? Um, and particularly the link to that as well, that's sort of the employment side, but on the other side, the passenger side, the, the fear or the reluctance to utilize mass transit systems that has emerged from the fear of contagion of, of, of the disease. Um, very dense Asian cities must be served by mass transit systems that link to non-motorized transport and that last mile connectivities that the paratransit or the informal transport provide. So it's looking at that. We also have a relatively low vehicle ownership rate, but what we have seen in the pandemic when the public transport was shut down, a, a, a massive increase in use and purchase of motorcycles. So we're seeing that shift away from the uh, mass transit that makes the cities function uh, to perhaps a much less sustainable drive towards private modes of transport and in the early, early phases that would be the, the motorbike side. So looking at that, there's sort of a history and the evolution and trying to bring it back to the COVID impacts on transport, particularly in, in very dense densely populated uh, Asian cities as well. In, in terms of what we would be um, taking away from this and talking to our client governments, my, my main thought is on that process and how we're looking at the, the procedures that make a better quality outcome, not just the laws for the sake of the laws, but really driving into what we would need to do and how the institution should function and support the operations as well as the production, uh, the delivery of that infrastructure as well. Thank you, James, for discussing ADB's own interest in 
the infrastructure and procurement process, as well as bringing up the mass transit systems, which I also see is a topic of interest from many of our audience. But I would like to turn the floor back to Professor Glazer to give his brief reactions to our panelists before we take some questions from the audience. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great, uh, great questions. So I will, uh, and I've been doing my best to get through the questions on the on the live chat, but uh, there there are so many of them. They're so good. It's 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 hard. Um, so uh, first of all, responding to the question about social capital, I, I think this is exactly right. Um, it's harder to know what that implies for government policy, uh, except for the fact that education is itself typically an ingredient in social capital. And so it, it provides yet another reason to invest in education. I, I was smiling when you mentioned food pantries for, because you're exactly right. For the first time in my life, I think, uh, I, I participated in volunteering for a food pantry this uh, Saturday for two hours because of, because of COVID. Uh, and it was a great experience. Um, and I think it's also true, which you highlighted as well, that you really do need uh, independent agencies to put a check on abusive government. So in the US, the COVID uh, period was very much linked to a great deal of protests against our policing. You really do need independent organizations to help put a check on, on policing. And I just wanna highlight that. Um, in response to the question of, of health, I see health and investments in cities as not some uh, alternative to effective cost benefit analysis, but as a necessary ingredient in all good cost benefit analysis, right? We need to think about what infrastructure, what transportation will do for health, what buildings will do for health. It just, it just needs to be added in. It doesn't mean that we should maximize health over everything else. That's, that's not, you know, that's not true. And it's, it's unrealistic in, uh, many particularly poorer places, but uh, it does mean we should always internalize it. Um, and I will highlight another thing, which is a, a memory that I had listening to you of, of my last trip in Manila, where there had again been the deaths of a number of people who had been living illegally, squatting in low-lying areas, and they had been drowned. And that's sort of another example of the need to have rules, which are actually enforced in order to protect um, health. Um, the comments about transportation were just great. Uh, and there was also a comment in the in the chat room about what does COVID-19 mean for transportation systems. I think that's partially a, a difference between the wealthy world and the poor world. So wealthy world transportation systems have, you know, shut down, they're way below capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, my friends who sort of run these systems are, are wringing their hands about what the future brings. Um, poor world transportation systems have rebooted because there's nothing else, there's nothing else to do. Um, I don't think there's a clear answer to this, but I do think pre-COVID, uh, there was very much a, a, of a debate between the extent to which poor world cities should embrace rich world transportation technologies, meaning metro systems, trail, even, even um, uh, bus rapid transit can be seen as an example of that, although it's perhaps it's a slightly less uh, costly and more efficient one, versus to what extent should they perhaps follow the Istanbul model and start with your decentralized minibus system and then try to upgrade it, try to integrate it in some ways. I have always had slightly more sympathy for upgrading the minibus system, but uh, I think certainly in an age of uncertainty about disease, the minibus system is in fact more flexible. Right, it is in fact one that can adapt more more easily, and so I think this puts an added impetus under our you know our the necessity of thinking about how to again better integrate the minibus system into the into the large scale metro systems as you suggested, and also thinking about how they can gradually be made safer, uh, more humane, and more resilient to disease. So thank you for three great set of comments. Thank you. Now let me just take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you have already touched upon mass transit system. So maybe I'll go with the second question that you have started answering here, um, which is about urbanization without industrialization in developing countries, especially when cities are built around extractive industries and non-tradable services. So what should be the balance between consumption and production activities for cities in developing Asia? Um, so this is a great question, and it's one I put I put an answer in the chat room of a paper that I wrote about this, the, the Marshall Lecture that I gave for the European Economics Association maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, the, the, the story here, in a sense, is that um, historically, countries needed to be wealthy before they could urbanize, because they needed to have enough agricultural surplus to provide for people to, you know, eat when they were doing urban activities. 
And so the US doesn't become 50% urban until 1920, when our per capita income in modern dollars is $8,000, right? England a little bit earlier, but still relatively rich by the standards of the poor world. Now, of course, it's possible for Port-au-Prince to be fed with rice shipped out of New Orleans that's much cheaper than anything that they could produce locally. And so you can have urbanization without industrialization. You can have urbanization without viable exports, perhaps paid for by natural resources, which is in some sense the African case. Um, this is a new thing. It started not uh, in Africa, but it started in Latin America. In the 1960s, there was a large literature on urbanization without uh, industrialization in Latin American countries, which is somewhat hopeful because even in those areas, um, those cities did not, um, you know, they, they ultimately led to economic growth. They ultimately led to Latin America becoming much richer than it was in the 1960s. I don't think this means all that much for Asia. I think the urbanization without industrialization is really an African problem. And if anything, a South, in, a South Asian problem, it's really an Indian problem. Because if we think that manufacturing has reached the point that there's just no low wage manufacturing option for growth, there's just no way that you're gonna leverage your comparative advantage, which is very cheap labor to, you know, for Africa to then leverage this to become a manufacturing powerhouse, then that path towards wealth is just closed off. When I look at East Asia, I look at countries that have already developed because of urban manufacturing, and now they're transitioning like American cities into urban services. And that's just fine. And it's not about urban consumption versus production. It's an issue of services versus manufacturing. And they're just very good reasons why manufacturing is not an urban activity, right? I mean, when Henry Ford made his cars hundred years ago, the average Ford worker had about 20 square meters of space, right? Mm -hmm that's perfectly compatible with urban offices or urban shops, right? That's a reasonable amount of space. Today in factories, you will often see 60 square meters. Heck, you'll see sometimes 200 square meters per, per person because there are so many machines relative to workers. You're never gonna put an industry where there are 200 square meters per person of stuff in an urban center. It makes absolutely no sense. You wanna put it in a place where land is cheap. And so that's what we've seen. But I don't think, uh, I don't think this is a problem for, um, the, at least not for the wealthier countries of, of East Asia. Um, for the poor countries, again, they've been more productive at doing urban manufacturing. I'm thinking about Vietnam, Bangladesh, and so forth. Um, and my guess is that they're going to continue working their way up the value chain and transitioning to services out of, out of urban manufacturing. Thank you for that. Um, here is a question that says, why do we need NATO, an agency like NATO, for global coordination instead of UN? So... Um, this is a proposal that we put forth in our new book, which is the sequel to our uh, to my book, Triumph of the City. It's called the somewhat less hopeful title, Survival of the City, that will be out this um, September. It's joint with the health economist and my Harvard colleague, D David Cutler. Um, the, um, we think that the WHO is underpowered. We think that a, a global consensus organization just doesn't have uh, the resources to, um, to, to fight pandemic. Uh, what you need is an organization. I very much did not mean that it was supposed to be centered on the North Atlantic. I just meant that the NATO model was the right the right model. So I hope very much I could certainly see, you know, many Asian countries as charter members of, of the NATO for health. Um, in fact, you know, given how well many Asian countries did in handling the pandemic, they're, they're a, a model for the West, not something for uh, the West to teach. Um, but the idea of a NATO for health is you need to have an, a small enough set of countries. You need to have a scientific decision making. Uh, process. You need to have uh, enough control over the money so that wealthy countries feel confident that they can actually invest in this because it actually requires real money. Um, you need to have the willingness to cut countries that are risks off either immediately when a pandemic emerges or um, and you need to cut them off out of the whole system. It's not enough to cut off, you know, transport to one country when there are still, you know, thousands of tourists who have come and gone to that country who have, who have been elsewhere. You need to be able to make the entire system and you need to have a, a monitoring system that actually enables that. That sounds to me like a lot more like NATO. The other thing that I, I, we have argued for in this NATO for health is something that's exactly the sort of ADB model, which is this, you know, aid in exchange for rules structure. So we get Americans to spend more on Indian sewers because we have learned now that a disease that starts anywhere can kill anywhere. And for that reason, the state of the sewers in Hyderabad is actually of importance to American taxpayers in uh, Indiana. 
as, as they are to Japanese taxpayers in Osaka. Uh, and so I think the right model is that we invest more in the sanitary infrastructure of the poor world, but the quid pro quo is that we actually have hygienic rules, that they accept better monitoring in the hospitals for the spread of contagious disease. So we're actually able to sort of enforce this early monitoring system. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of interesting questions coming in. So one here says urban management and governance or lack of it may have more to do with the impact of COVID-19 on cities than density. Do you agree? Um, not really. Okay. I, I believe that urban management is absolutely central for many, many problems. But the weird thing about COVID is that it struck well-managed and poorly managed cities uh, in many senses, uh, cases in very similar ways. Right, you have a very stark division between Northern Europe and Southern Europe in terms of the quality of urban management. I would I would say the quality of urban management in places like Stockholm and Copenhagen is on a, on a level almost almost with East Asian cities. Right, not quite there, but almost with East Asian cities in terms of the quality the quality of, of urban management. The quality of urban management in the south of Italy is not very good. Uh, the quality of urban management in in many parts of of uh, Iberia is not is not great. Um, and yet, you know, uh, the COVID pandemic was terrible in, in Sweden. It was terrible in, in uh, many parts of, it was terrible in, in the Netherlands, which is also a, uh, uh, you know, and part of the problem is while there are many problems that, you know, cities can take care of, um, urban management doesn't shut borders. Urban management doesn't invest in vaccines. Urban management just doesn't have the things that you need to actually manage a, a pandemic. And so when you think about like what, countries that really responded well uh, to COVID-19 looked like. And, and I would include, you know, South Korea, a superstar in, in this, um, uh, Japan, Singapore. Well, Singapore, it is urban management, but Singapore is also a country. So it has the ability to actually enforce borders. Um, you know, New Zealand is a poster child uh, of good management. And this is about, you know, shutting down early. It's about, you know, closing travel to the outside world. It's about imposing real quarantine on people who come in, not just, uh, you know, you, you manage it yourself, but when people come in, you actually enforce the quarantine rules. And it's about not reopening until you've tested the asymptomatic and are sure that it's gone, right? I mean, the problem with America's rules, first of all, it's, it's impossible to do this on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, you really have got to do it on a, on a country basis. But also, you know, America's states in the South reopened on hope, right? They reopened in May just because they hadn't seen many cases yet, but they weren't testing the asymptomatic whereas New Zealand was. And you really have to you know, have the humility to learn. You really need to test the asymptomatic before you know that the disease is gone and you can, you can reopen. New Zealand did it, the United States didn't. And I think of that as really a national health policy. So while I, I love the spirit of your question in a sense that I believe urban management is the, is the right answer for everything most of the time, I actually think it was not the right answer for, for COVID. You actually needed a, a functional national government. Thank you. Um, related to network of cities, uh, in the US and Europe, we see many mid-sized cities, whereas in Asia, we see more mega cities. So policymakers tend to think about ways to develop satellite towns and cities. Do you think this is the right approach or should we just let mega cities get larger? So the, re the way you should understand this is that um, the small cities in Europe are a reflection of the fact that Europe urbanized during uh, a much earlier time period. Right. And I, I, I want to sort of be careful about this because obviously, like the largest cities in the world for a thousand years were all in Asia. Right. So they were they were great Chinese cities long before they were they were great European cities. But the current um, but the reason why you don't feel the hold of China's uh, when you see so many mega cities in, in China is, in fact, China's the number of people in China is so large that even though you have a lot of you know cities in China, right, you have you have a lot of cities that are spread out reflecting that medieval heritage, just this flow of people is just so enormous. So a mid-sized city in China has five million people, right, which is, you know, would make it one of the largest cities in, in Europe. Um, Europe, however, had its urban structure formed in the in, you know, the late Middle Ages. And it has not seen the same population explosion. And because transportation costs were so high, you have little towns everywhere. They're essentially former market towns that existed to, to take care of the rural hinterland. Um, that system is not obviously more efficient uh, than in um, uh, than than a mega city based system. Uh, I, I don't think they would you know build it again that way if it was starting from scratch. But it was the you know it is it is the history and it has certain charms. Um, 
I don't think there's a reason to play favorites with mid-sized cities versus mega cities. I, I think the right answer is that national governments should have a level playing field and then let cities compete just like they should with companies. Now, uh, that, you know, that, that needs to be coupled with a couple of caveats. First of all, we should have policies that work against the downsides of density. So we should have things that, you know, we need to charge people for the congestion they create. We need to make sure that property owners are paying for the cost of providing urban infrastructure, which is expensive, right? That means functional property taxes. It may well be that imposing those costs on the people who swell megacities would reduce the growth of megacities somewhat. And I think that's, that's you know, a, certainly a, a hypothesis and a possibility. Um, and it is certainly true that some of the growth of megacities involves th things that I think of as being less healthy, which is either the presence of political lures so think about sort of imperial capitals that attract people largely to be close to the centers of power. That's not a particularly healthy thing. Or just the fact that you have an abundance of, you know, informal settlements where no one is actually charging people for the value of the land that they're using in cities. Both of those things will cause megacities to grow excessively. And I certainly want to, you know, affirm my faith with the idea of having, you know, better property rights in cities. In fact, I have a new paper on, on that that's forthcoming in the Journal of Law and Economics about the role of property rights in shaping urban form. Um, the, um, and I think it's worthwhile asking, what are the barriers to the growth of, of uh, mid-sized cities? Um, and in some cases, I think those, those barriers can be alleviated, but I don't think we should have a clear thing, which is we favor cities that are in the middle and not in the, in, in, you know, uh, not large ones. I think we should let them all grow. Um, and I've actually, you know, uh, I, I think this is even, I've even pushed back uh, in a small way in, in the writing in a column in the People's Daily a couple of years ago about the limits that China was putting on the growth of uh, Shanghai and, and Beijing, which I think were, you know, there's just so much energy in Shanghai. It's a shame to see it, it's it held back. Well, we maybe have time for just one more question. And I will take the question, a follow up question from um, VP Susantono. Uh, he wonders if you believe there is an optimum size of a city. Thank you for that great question. I certainly do not. <laughs> I, believe, I believe that, in fact, there's lots of heterogene heterogeneity among human beings. And some people like mid-sized cities and some people like large cities. And so great countries offer a portfolio of different cities for people to, to move to. Some industries work better in big cities. Some industries work better in smaller cities. And so, again, you know, great cities are archipelagos of neighborhoods that give people different options. Great countries have, you know, sizes of different cities. The way I think about this always is that generally productivity tends to rise with city size, but so do the downsides of density. OK, and, you know, better urban management makes those downsides is smaller. And so a city like Singapore, which is very well managed or Seoul or Tokyo can handle enormous scale and still be quite livable um, in the developing world, in the poor parts of the world. You know, the downsides of density can be much more obvious and painful. Um, but because the benefits of cities differ for different people, there's no one right size. And so we should, you know, embrace the challenges of fighting those downsides of density in the 21st century. We should embrace in particular, uh, given that this is the ADB, the need for you know, high quality infrastructure that is evaluated with the best cost benefit analysis in the world that takes into account health needs, that takes into account the uncertainty around infrastructure. We should continue to press on making sure that procurement is more efficient and higher quality uh, going forward. Um, and we should continue to fight to make the cities of the world more livable. And I just want to end by thanking all of you for the work that all of you do to make urban Asia succeed. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Glazer. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our scheduled time and all good things must come to an end. It was truly a rich and fruitful lecture as well as discussion. And we are left with many fascinating insights to apply in our work, including in a post pandemic world. From the Asian Development Bank, I would like to thank Professor Edward Glazer for sharing his valuable time with us today. Thank you also to you, the audience, for your active participation. If you enjoyed today's webinar, please join us again for the next Asian Impact webinar titled Measuring the Digital Economy on 23rd June 2021, Wednesday at 4 p.m. Manila time via Zoom. Thank you for joining us and stay safe.